Everybody. Welcome to System Crafters Live. I'm David Wilson, and we're back today with another live stream where we get together as a community and talk about some cool topic related to system crafting in some way, either by GNU Geeks, GNU Emacs, or whatever it is that I have come up with for the week. And uh, this week is no different. Of course, this week is different than the last two weeks, which I didn't actually do a live stream. And I want to say <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Uh, it's been a wild time recently trying to get established here. Uh, in Greece and um, we're like this close now. I think we're just about to get ready to move into a place. And if you're surprised to hear me say I'm about to move into a place, that's because it's taken, what is it, like seven months now to actually, like we've been here for maybe seven or eight months, I think. And uh, yeah, it's it's been a hell of a journey, but uh, we're almost to a point now where things will be a little bit more stable. I won't have random things I have to do five days a week. And uh, yeah, it will be a lot better. But uh, I'm happy to see all of you here. I'd like to say hello to the folks who are here so far. Peter, Bill, Kyle, uh, someone with uh, characters I can't read because my browser doesn't show them correctly. Uh, Matthew, Rune, uh, Specially, I don't know if that's right. Uh, Pavel, Robert, Richard, Daigo, Tomas, uh, Valentino, Alejandro, uh, Edicius, and Gunn. Thanks, everybody, for being here. I appreciate, appreciate you all being here. Mayush, uh, Jordanis. Uh, yes, I am in Greece. That's right. Uh, Anton, uh, Ashraz, hello. Ashraz says, uh, Meta X Real Estate. Yeah. So, yeah, like I said, it's been a hell of a journey. Uh, Eric says, my Discord got hacked a couple days ago. The issue is fixed now, but now I can't rejoin the server. Okay. Um, that's weird. I don't know if you got banned from the server. Maybe, Ashraz, can you look into uh, whether the Atheist Coder uh, is banned on the server? Maybe you can unban him. Uh, Khalid, Thomas, nice to see ya. Okay, so, whoa, where's the first slide? Updates. So I actually did um, finally record a video. I did it today, which is why I haven't posted it yet because I still have to do a little bit of editing, make the thumbnail, get all the stuff together that's necessary for posting a video, but I think I'm gonna post it tomorrow. A little bit unorthodox for me to post a video on Saturday, but I think it probably doesn't matter because you know YouTube likes to push things to your uh, your home feed anyway, so you'll probably see it whenever you go to YouTube the next time. Uh, so the idea is um, this will be the third video in the new Emacs from Scratch series where I'm going to show you how to uh, customize the look of Emacs by using the Modus themes. Um, maybe you've heard about them before. They're a theme uh, created by uh, Silao Stavru, and they are really good, but when you load them at first, they don't really look so special, but there's a lot of configuration you can do to it to make it look better. So I'm gonna, I made a video that goes through all, well, not all, but a lot of the ways you might wanna configure it, and I'll prove to you that it actually is pretty configurable, and you can come up with something that looks pretty good uh, if you just you know read the manual and try some things out. So that's what we're gonna do. Uh, Kyle says, we really missed you in the streams. Well, I missed all of you as well. You know, I have a lot of fun streaming. I have a lot of fun making videos and it's been difficult uh, to not have as much time. And it also has been difficult to get started up again because I don't know, it's it's really difficult to get in the rhythm of making videos and doing streams whenever you've been away for a while, but um, I'm happy to be back at it. Thanks, Pavel, for taking care of that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Alejandro says, recorded videos are healthy for the community and probably your sanity. Well, it, it, they're also harder for me to make because I'm a little bit of a perfectionist and I try to cram too much stuff in there because I want everybody to have all the details. And I think <laughs> I haven't edited the video yet, but I think it's probably going to be about 30 to 40 minutes long, which is obviously too long for a video about a single color theme. But there's a lot of stuff to talk about. So that's just the way it ended up being, unfortunately. But uh, I'm happy to have that video coming out because it does sort of, you know, take us one step forward on that series and also gets me a little bit back into the, the momentum of making videos again. I've got a lot of ideas for things I want to make videos on, so I'm just going to try to ride the wave and keep putting stuff out uh, 
every <laughs> every every week. I'm gonna try to get it every week again. Paul says, first time live watcher. Hello from Montreal, Canada. Keep up the great work. Hey, nice to see you. Glad to see some uh, uh, nice folks from from Canada here. We we are a worldwide community, which I think is really awesome. Uh, Gun says live GoPro at the realtor's office. Yeah, you don't really want to see those kinds of uh, transactions here. I think there's lots of yelling. Okay, so today what I want to talk about is um, this is a caveat up front. This is completely unprepared, but it's just based on some thoughts I've been having for a while now that I haven't really been able to act on. And what we're going to do is just discuss some strategies on how to create an Emacs configuration that can satisfy a few different goals. Um, I have a sort of an idea in mind, but we'll talk about it a little bit. I'm also very interested to hear your ideas as well about how uh, we can get there. First of all, works well across multiple platforms. That one is not so hard to imagine because there's, you know, variables or functions you can use in Emacs to figure out what platform you're running on. But um, there are some wrinkles to that that I'll tell you about, especially if you're using GNU Geeks and, and Geeks Home, um, that I kind of want to cover because I think it would be interesting to discuss um, how you might approach making such a configuration. Uh, also, we can talk about you know how that is impacted whenever you want. also want to run it on Termux, but I can't really show you. Well, I can show you how I do it currently. I don't really use it very often, but it is um, a particular use case that you might want to have a uh, modular configuration that can work well on mobile. I mean, Android, uh, also can be configured with geeks. Pretty important for me because, you know, I really enjoy using geeks. I keep thinking about, you know, the possibility of switching to another distro for a while. And I don't know, like I'm just too ingrained in geeks by this point. But what I don't do right now is use geeks home to configure my, uh, my entire Emacs configuration. It sounds like a crazy idea, but there's a pretty straightforward way to do it. It's something that the RDE channel that Andrew Tropin made does. So if you've ever looked into that, this is not going to be much of a surprise to you. Um, but uh, it is something that, that I want to focus on when I start, you know, making progress on redoing my own configuration soon. Uh, also, enable standalone Emacs sessions. And you're probably thinking as an Emacs user, why would you want to have standalone Emacs sessions? And what, what I mean by that is... Instead of having one long lived Emacs session that you use for everything, perhaps it would make sense to have one core Emacs session for, you know, writing your notes, um, you know, tracking tasks, you know, maybe using the shell for system management things, et cetera, but then possibly having independent Emacs instances for specific projects you're working on so that you can have more of a clean slate. Um, you know, one of the things that people do a lot in Emacs is have uh, workspace packages, which I use, um, which helps you to separate the buffers that you are using for various projects. But really, the other way to do that is just to have standalone Emacs sessions. And if you're going to go so far to do that, it might be interesting to think about how you would only load the things necessary for that project you're working on. So this is another thing we could talk about in terms of having a modular uh, Emacs configuration for enabling this, this type of work. Uh, let's see. Let me uh, answer some questions here. Uh, Gun says modular sounds a bit like layers in Space Max. Eh, uh, it's more like, let's see, someone mentioned rational Emacs. I thought I saw yeah, so Ashra says, uh, or the modules in Rational, that's more like what I have in mind, actually. So we, we might take a look at Rational in that context. Uh, let's see. Hey, Benoit, nice to see you. Uh, Skia says, just came in to say hi. Well, hi. Uh, Alejandro says, modular like private packages or wi wildly loading Emacs list code from files. More like, you know, having your own uh, Emacs list modules that you load in. The, sort of the literal definition of modularity in this case. Uh, Benoit says the surf way to do multi-tab launch multi-instance. Yeah, um, you could do that too. You actually, you could use, uh, what is that program? The suck, suck less, whoops, uh, the suck less program, suck less, uh, tab. There's some kind of program they have for, yeah, tabbed. Where you could basically make any program like tabbed effectively. I think they, they use that for DWM to do something sort of like what, uh, you have with, uh, i3. Surf browser, yeah. Surf is also suck less, right? Is it not? Surf. Yes. Okay. Gun says, what about daemon mode and several clients? Uh, well, the problem there is you still have shared buffers, a shared buffer list. And I kind of want to have like separate instances. 
All right, so uh, let's go back. So I've literally not written anything. So I'm going to just tell you some things I'm thinking about for for these. And maybe we'll try to hack on some stuff a little bit. But we have to sort of, you know, flesh out the ideas a little bit first. Uh, Tomas says, Emacs 29 just gained a command line option to specify a startup directory. So it now should be a lot easier to have different configs. That's really cool. I didn't know about that. Um, let's see. Uh things to look at in fact let me do this things to look at but the, the likelihood is that we would probably end, end up using something more like uh kim x2 yeah peter also said the same thing just now uh kim x2 also works nice for that yes definitely um, someone says, is this EXWM? Yes, it is. It might not be EXWM for long because I'm, you know, still thinking about switching to a different window manager, but we'll see. Okay. So let's actually just break these down into separate um, headings. And we're just, whoa. I got to unbind these arrow keys. They always mess me up. Now we're just going to do it live. Let's do some org file editing. Okay, so works well across multiple platforms. So what is the, the variable for that? Is it um, system type? Yeah, so the system type variable is pretty use, useful. I almost said useless, but, which is totally the opposite of what I mean. Uh, the value is a symbol indicating the type of operating system you're using. Special values are GNU, compiled for a GNU herd system. Like, whoever heard of that? Uh, GNU Linux, compiled for GNU Linux system, GNU KFreeBSD, that's interesting, I think you can do that with um, uh, Debian, MS-DOS, um, I would be really surprised if anybody's using uh, Emacs on MS-DOS these days, but I've never tried it, I should actually try that one day, Windows NT, which is basically Windows, Sigwin, uh, using Sigwin library, oh, I think I missed Darwin, so that's uh, Mac OS, so obviously you can just use the... Uh, Use system type variable to choose which um, configuration parts to load. In fact, I think we should maybe spend a little bit of time before that talking about what such a configuration might look like at a high level. Let me pop out of this for a second. I'm trying to think of the right way to, to organize this. All right, so. Uh, modular configuration style. So the way that I would go about this is what we've basically already done in Rational Emacs. Uh, like Rational Emacs, split um, various parts of functionality into separate Emacs Lisp modules that are part of your own configuration now these can be things that get pulled from other places as well you can share them with other people but uh, most people are going to have their own set of files that they uh set up so that um you can load them in as modules and when i talk about that in the context of rational emacs what i really mean is if we go into code rational emacs this is going to be super out of date maybe i can update it really fast by the way, kudos to uh, Jeff Bowman for staying on top of the PRs and helping people get things uh, merged in. It's been really nice to see that project uh, continuing. Also, to all the contributors who've been coming and adding things recently, there's a lot of cool stuff happening. I need to try it again uh, one day soon. So in the Rational Emacs folder, uh, we've got this modules folder, and there's a bunch of individual modules for various different things. Like here's one I haven't seen before, Rational Python. You go on here, and there's just a bunch of uh, configuration stuff for uh, using Emacs to edit Python. Now, uh, let's see, several Python packages can be installed with pip, blah, 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 blah. That's sort of the dependencies you might need. And then um, package installation. So, you know, generally with a, uh, a modular configuration where you have like one Emacs list file that is sort of self-contained and can help you set up a configuration, you would need to say which packages are uh, things that need to be installed. So in this case, we have a bunch of uh, functions being called here, or same function being called to install a few different packages. Might be nice to actually make this 
function take a list of package names. Um, also, uh, you know, any other configuration you need to do, like setting up hooks. Um, but really, it's just like having a file that can turn on Python functionality whenever you load it. Now, the way that you would actually pull this into your configuration would be um, inside of your config file, you would just do a, uh, I think it's require, right? Require rational Python. So Emacs already gives you the necessary functionality to create modular configurations. Um, you create a module file, you have it in a specified module path, which I'll tell you about in a second. And then you can just pull that into your configuration using require. Now, um, the implication of this is that you can specify per platform which packages that you want to load. Hey, Jeff, I was just talking about you. Um, so, for instance, I think uh, we can use like pcase, right? Let's just check out pcase for a second. So expression cases, yes. So pcase is pretty useful for this. So I would say like uh, pcase, yeah, Rational Python is not probably the best example for that, but let's say pcase uh, system type, I think. Yeah. And then um, for each case, you would say something like uh, GNU Linux. And you could say, you know, require uh, Rational Python type. And then I think, I don't know if that's the right syntax. Let me actually see here. I run that does it work can i open file okay so it, it did whoa it did actually do something i don't know why this buffer did that though um also similarly we could say uh windows nt you know on windows you don't do that maybe you require something else instead like require rational uh powershell which doesn't exist and i don't really see why it would but you know if you were on windows and you needed something related to you know you dealing with powershell or dealing with any kind of windows related stuff then you could have a different require there uh this is kind of a brutal pattern though because you don't want to have to do a bunch of requires inside of each thing you could do that i believe that you know calling multiple uh things here will work let's see message does it work let's see yeah i think that the um well maybe it's better to do it this way let's move this up right there and then try it again and let's check uh, messages. Come on now. What did I just do? Okay, so it didn't work. Maybe I've got the syntax wrong. Let me just double check that. In fact, let me look at my own configs. I, I think I have a pcase for that. Pcase. Okay, here we are. I already have that. Uh, pcase system type. Ah, I need to give it the actual symbol uh, character there. All right, Rational Python, let's go check the messages. Does it work? Okay, so multi-line does work inside there. So in theory, if you want to just have it be sort of messy, you could just do everything in line there. But I think we could probably, you know, write something that works a little bit more cleanly than this. Um, but we'll, we'll think about that in a little bit. Basically, the point that I'm trying to make is that um, you could easily have an init.el that is very simple, that only just requires various modules that provide the functionality that you need on any of these platforms. So on, on Linux, maybe you have a certain set of things that you want to, to install or, or load. Maybe on Windows, you, you don't pull some of those things in. Like for instance, this app launcher uh, package that I use for launching Linux apps, that doesn't work on Windows, so I wouldn't even bother loading it. So, you know, you could have that as part of a, you know, like a desktop environment module that doesn't get pulled in on Windows or on Mac OS, etc. So I think that it makes sense to try to have your parts of your configuration pulled into different Emacs list module files and uh, require them to pull them into your configuration based on which platform you use. Let me take a look at the uh, chat really quick, see if I missed anything. Uh, let's see, uh, Alejandro says, Emacs 29 breaks some things in my EXWM config and other packages haven't had time to debug. Let's go take a little look at the EXWM uh, issues because I think someone filed an issue on that. Uh, 29 does break EXWM apparently. So if you are using EXWM on Emacs 29, the latest stuff, um, there is a discussion on Emacs Devel about that. Uh, so something about uh, Emacs 29 is messing with XELB, which is sort of the core of EXWM that talks to um, 
the X server through XCB. So I don't know what the what the details are on that, but that is why things aren't working correctly right now. And I don't really know if it's been fixed. Um, <clears throat> there's only one email, right? Pre even thread. There's not even anything else. So let's see EXWM. Kind of curious. Uh, externals, blah, blah, blah. This is all 2016. Anyway. Uh, so that's, you know, just a heads up in case you do use uh, EXWM. Maybe you don't want to uh, check out Emacs 29 just yet. Um, Ashra says Emacs 29 is still a development version, though, so it'll take quite a while until all users can use it. Yes, definitely. Hey, Drishal and Amal Vedia. Uh, Amal says, uh, any issues with EXWM? Make I'll tell you again, I've, I've, we've talked about it a few times. I'm just switching over to EXWM using your uh, videos would be good to know if you think there are some issues with it. There are only issues specifically for me because... Um, if I'm in Emacs and I'm demonstrating things with the Emacs that I'm using as my desktop environment, if I do anything that causes the Emacs to crash, then the video that I'm recording dies or the stream that I'm doing dies. And I've had that happen a number of times already, and I just want to avoid that kind of problem in the future. So that's the main reason. Just the fact that, uh, upsetting Emacs can ruin your day if you are me. But for the average person who's not trying to do live streams using EXWM, probably it's not a huge issue because it just crashes and you load your session back up again, depending on how you manage your work. Um, there's other sort of fit and finish type issues with EXWM that might make you want to look at something else. But um, if you get into using EXWM, you'll find that it's hard to stop using it because it's too convenient to have all of Emacs functionality at your fingertips all the time. So even while I'm sitting here in this Firefox window, I can hit Meta X and just jump right into, you know, the Meta X command list. So yeah, it's it's a very um, sticky interface in that it will keep you there even if you are having a lot of trouble with it. Uh, Gun says, "What about MSS2 or Ming W64?" That's a good question. I'm not sure which one it shows up at. Oh, I think it may show up as Sigwin because there is a. Uh, let's see. System type, Sigwin. I don't really use it there, though. I'm I'm more inclined to use it... Well, okay, I understand what you're asking, though. I think in the Emacs for Windows build, it shows up as Windows NT, even though they build it using uh, Ming W64. Or... Yeah, so that that's all fine. But if you run it from inside of the Ming W64 shell, I don't know what it does. It might actually look like it's Sigwin, but uh, yeah. Hard to know for sure. I haven't tried it in a while. Um, Pablo says, what's GNU Darwin? Uh, Darwin is like the name for uh, OS X, I think. And they, 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 don't, they don't call it that anymore. Let's see. Uh, Mac OS Dar Mouse. Mac OS Darwin. Darwin operating system. Maybe it's still the same. Okay. So it's still Darwin, apparently even though they've, you know, completely retrofitted everything many times by this point. But yeah, that's basically Mac OS. Uh, Matthew says, and hello, Matthew, by the way, I've, I've seen system type and system name used, but I couldn't find a good usage example for the latter. Dear locals exist. Well, um, it's a good question. I think that system name probably comes into effect whenever you have configurations that need to be different per system. However, um, I feel like Geeks is the right way to, to deal with that, um, or specifically Geeks Home. If you can use Geeks Home to manage your Emacs configuration, then the per system thing is taken care of at that level, and your Emacs config doesn't have to hard code system name checks. I think it's not really a good idea to hard code system name checks, even though you can do it and um, it works, but um, it's better if... Well, if you did it, I think it should be done at the top level. So basically the, the model that I am uh, advocating for here, where's my org file? Um, the ideal model is to have an uh, init.el file that purely just loads in the necessary uh, modules for a given machine plus any additional modules that are uh, context specific. And that will come back when we start talking about, you know, uh, single purpose Emacs sessions. 
Hey, GK Sudo. Uh, would Rat Poison be a viable option for you? It's pretty much all written in C. I haven't used Rat Poison. Well, have I ever used it? I may have turned it on. I may have run it once and I'm like, okay, this is pretty extreme. So I just didn't end up uh, trying it again. But I do need to check it out. I think it would be pretty cool to, uh, to give that a shot again. I'm, I'm thinking about the possibility of making a series of videos about various different um, window managers. Since window managers are a core part of your workflow, especially if you're doing system crafting, which involves like basically choosing all the tools you're using and making a specific system configuration. So um, I think I do want to branch out and start talking about these things. And I would definitely talk about things like Rat Poison or DWM uh, as a result of that especially because you can customize, it, customize them by writing code, which I think is a pretty interesting idea. Let's see. Uh, Ashra says, before we write a second rational, who is a target user of today's configuration? Well, I would not write a second rational. I would actually probably try to use rational for that. Um, because the reason why rational is set up the way that it is right now is because I was already thinking about this before I started that project. Um, sort of the, the grand goal would have been and may still be to make a Geeks distribution that builds on top of Geeks and the Emacs configuration could be pulled in from Rational Emacs using a similar model to what I'm basically discussing here. However, I'm not entirely sure I would I would go all the way down that route just because um, it's a little bit heavy handed, I would say. <laughs> I mean, you could write your own modules that you, know, you don't have to use the Rational modules at all, but um, you know, it would be a very specific system configuration i think that goes a little bit against the ethos of the channel it's more about making your own stuff so some thoughts to be had about that i think hey edis uh i'm glad you showed up just to say hello let's see uh Drishal says for me all i do is organize my config in org mode source blocks and tangle the needed blocks and if i do not need a block i just add tangle note well um you know, obviously, <clears throat> I've done that for a long time. My configuration is like that, but I'm kind of like getting a little bit tired of it, to be honest. I've mentioned this a bunch of times. I, I feel like it's an unnecessary layer of complexity sometimes to just, you know, sync your configuration and um, apply it to new machine because I do have three or four machines that all use the same base configuration and uh, I delay syncing changes between the machines because it's such a pain in the ass to keep them up to date but that's really primarily because of like the three different methods i'm using for managing dot files all at the same time now i've got you know just a normal org mode based thing i've got the dot crafter dot el thing and now i've got geeks home thrown into that so it's gotten way too complex i need to sort of redo everything using one strategy so i'm part of the reason why i'm thinking about all this is that i'm going to try to um do this with geeks home instead uh, let's see, uh, Gun says, what about presenting a menu with checkboxes when firing up Emacs where you can select a presently needed functionality? Um, well, I, you could do that for sure. You could have like, like a dashboard like experience, um, or you could have some commands that you could run that would pull up certain functionality. Certainly a possibility. You could do that. Alejandro uh, uh, Saharoff says, hey man, I really appreciate your video series. I drop uh, Emacs distributions and using my own for everyday work. That's awesome. Glad to hear it. Thanks. Oops, let's see. Jumping ahead. Hello, Fade. Nice to see you. Yeah, Ashraz was telling me. I, I'm looking at, like, the, the history of the chat. I probably shouldn't be, like, sc scrolling back so far. Uh, Benma says, I need uh, e-ment at home but not at work. Yeah, for using, uh, um, what you call it, Matrix. Yeah. And Ashra says that sounds like using uh, use packages if keyword definitely is like that, but I don't know. I also think that having one huge Emacs Lisp file with a bunch of uh, use package blocks with ifs in there is not necessarily the best way to have all your Emacs config stuff, especially if you want it to load fast. Um, so, you know, use package does a pretty good job, I think, but. I I kind of like, I feel like a sort of a config purity desire coming on for myself to like try to just do things just purely in Emacs Lisp and in Scheme for the purpose of uh, Geeks Home, so. 
Noble says, I tried uh, Rational Emacs the other day, loving reading through the code and throwing over a minimal natural set of code for my almost bankrupt config. Cool. That's nice. Uh, Pablo says, I haven't had EXWM crash for a few months already. Yeah, like I said, it, it's usually the stuff that I'm doing that causes EXWM to crash. Uh, let's see. Let me just skip ahead. Uh, Monty Condon says, uh, are you still using Org Roam for knowledge management or moved on to other tools? That's a great question uh, because I've switched back to Org Roam. Not because anything of, about log seek. It's just like being so familiar with the Emacs experience uh, and having everything configured the way that I like it. It's really difficult switching to another program to write notes, even though it does have some nice features. So I'm basically back into Org Roam now, uh, doing all the stuff that I was doing before in uh, LogSeq. Doesn't have all the same functionality, but you know, it's Emacs. So what can I say? Uh, Ashra says, I believe I might not be part of the target audience as my init.el is only 290 lines. Well, it's nice whenever you can be that minimal. And I would also aspire to be so minimal. There's a lot of stuff in my config I wanna throw away. So I don't know. I, I'm getting to the point now where I'm going to uh, start throwing a lot out. Amal says, the only thing that I've had EXWM crash from is the XF86 keys. Yeah, I wonder if it's a program that you were launching from those or something that caused that. Someone asks, uh, how do you achieve the slide-like page inside org mode? Uh, you should check out the link to my configuration in um, the, the show notes or the description, whatever it's called, and uh, check out the org-present config, org dash present that will give you uh an idea of how i do it i actually do want to make a video about that pretty soon because i get that question really often about how i do my uh, my, my presentation slides all right back to what we were saying before so uh, modular configuration style so um having an init.el file that purely just loads in the necessary modules for a given machine another way to look at this is to look at um, init.el, let's go to readme. In the readme for rational emacs, there is an example or is it in an examples folder? Examples, example of config.el. This is basically what I'm thinking about is you have, this is called example config.el, but my in my mind, an init.el file could basically be a file that only just pulls in requires. Now, obviously some of these things would not be pulled in except for on specific platforms. Um, so we need a way to do that easily. Emacs gives us all the, the code patterns that we need to accomplish that, but um, it's not the nicest looking code to write. So it might be cool to write a macro, which we could try to do really quick to make that easier. Uh, we might give that a shot in a second. Uh, Alejandro says, EXWM crashes whenever I click my Bluetooth head earphones buttons. Interesting. I haven't heard about that before. You know, there is some weird stuff with how EXWM manages key maps. I've actually had problems with that in the past. Like we're talking 2019. I remember sending issues to the EXWM um, issue tracker, which you could probably find if you look for it. But the thing that happened was whenever I plugged in an external keyboard, it would try to, to reload the key maps basically to account for this new keyboard. And it would just lock up all keyboard handling. I couldn't press any keys anymore in EXWM and I would have to kill EXWM and restart it. So because there's a lot of special case key handling inside of EXWM, it doesn't really surprise me that there could be bugs related to pressing certain keys, especially non-standard keys, like the ones, whatever the Bluetooth headphone button shows up as. Um, yeah. Monty Condon says, uh, going to stay away from tiling window managers and just use desktop environments. Yeah, you could certainly do that. There's no reason why you should use a tiling window manager if you don't feel like you really need it. Um, the only thing that I don't like about, well, I'd say the biggest thing I don't like about the, the desktop environments is it just loads so much stuff that you probably won't even use. There's so much stuff running in the background, so many programs, like everything is really complex. Um, they look really nice, you know, both GNOME and KDE look really nice. They look like modern desktop environments, uh, but they are very heavyweight. XSCE is on the better side of that. There's a few others like, you know, LXQT, et cetera, that are, you know, not so heavy, but still, I just like picking specific tools to use at, that work into my workflow. Haha, <laughs> yeah, yep. Uh, 1,929 packages. Yeah, it's it's kind of insane how many packages they pull in. 
Uh, Full Power 1600 from Twitch says, Hello, System Crappers. Awesome videos and all. I was trying to get back into Emacs after I dabbled with it in my music study. Wow, that's cool. Uh, what, what were you using Emacs for with uh, music study? That sounds awesome. Bill says, XFCE here. Yeah, um, probably in 2006, 2007 time frame, I was all in on XFCE and used it quite extensively because I liked how minimal it was while still having like a nice panel experience, etc. I didn't get into tiling window managers until probably um, 2014. I think that's when I started looking into i3. Fade says Stump WM. Yep, Stump is good. I mean, I tried it for a while. You probably saw me on streams trying it for a while, but I didn't really stick with it. I can't even remember remember why now. I, I think the problem was that Stump crashed on me during a stream once. I'm like, okay, I'm looking for stability, and if I can't get stability, then I might as well just use EXWM. Full Power says I used it for programming computer music with C sound and common music. Programmed a ton of stuff in Guile. Nice. That, that is a very viable use case for Emacs, doing live music coding. Um, you know, C-Sound is pretty cool. Uh, you know, there is... Um, what else? Someone mentioned Lilypond before. I think it was Noble and Savage. Yeah, that's another thing you can use for making music. A little bit more like, you know, mm, sheet music, though. Some other stuff, too. Overtone is kind of a big package for Emacs. I don't know if you've ever heard of Overtone. That uses Super Collider under the hood, I believe. And uh, it's kind of a more um, holistic Emacs configuration package. They still maintain this. Okay, Feb 14th, nice. So it was made by the guy who uh, eventually made the Sonic Pi, uh, Sam Aaron, I think his name is. Pretty cool. I mean, you can just do live music uh, coding in Emacs, but I think it does sort of take over your whole experience. Yeah, Super Collider is kind of interesting. Eric says, I would love Stump WM if it supported Wayland. I believe there's a, let's see, Stump WM for Wayland. There's something for that mahogany. So I don't know what the status is of this. Oh, okay. So they haven't made a commit since 2021. So I don't know like if this is usable or, or not. But the idea is that this would be the uh, Wayland version of Stump WM. It's even under the Stump org. Noble and Savage says Emacs with profile, profile Overtone. Yeah, for sure. You could do that. <laughs> Fade says at one point I was using the Overtone Emacs config for my general config. That sounds pretty awesome. I mean, you can see, I don't know where the, the whole uh, neon look comes from. I mean, obviously that doesn't, that's not part of Emacs, but maybe this is terminal mode uh, Emacs with uh, one of those funky terminals that has, you know, like the color distortion and stuff. Who knows? Not sure, but uh, yeah, it'd be pretty funny to use this as your actual main Emacs config. Okay, back to, where are we? Right here. Uh, Fade says, I'm colorblind, so the bright colors work for me. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Uh, first name, last name says, isn't Stump WM still not able to handle separate monitors when switching workspaces? Yes. Uh, so far, I'm sticking with Herb Stluff WM. That's that's probably the window manager I will talk about first because I'm kind of interested in it. Uh, I, I keep trying to set things up in it, and I don't ever spend enough time to finish it, but it's pretty solid. Dominic says, I, I think I saw a post that said that, that, it's, that the colors are coming from the terminal emulator. Yeah, I bet that's what is, what's happening. Okay. So um, back to the point, modular configuration style. So that's basically what I wanted to say is like, if you have that init.el file, uh, you have the ability to just load up whatever modules you need for whatever purpose. So um, the base configuration would only load the uh, necessary things for everyday use. Uh, however, you might have um, environment variables or uh, command line flags to enable a specific uh, profile. Sounds like MX2, right? So um, you can check environment variables in a configuration very easily. So if I were to go back to that in that yell, there is a get env function, I believe it is get env. So if I check the function docs for that, uh, get env gets the variable of the environment variable variable. 
it's a lot of variables. And if you, let's say if I just say path here, I can get the value of the path for this instance of Emacs. So uh, that is one way to sort of pass in um, something. You could say like, you know, my config profile uh, as a environment variable. And then you could, you know, do something based on the result that this comes back with. And uh, with Kimx2, if you go to my emacsprofiles.el, you can see that one of them has um, the rational Emacs home environment variable set here with this little env field. So you could set up multiple profiles for different use cases using Kimx2 if you wanted to, using this sort of um, environment variable checking strategy. There's another way you could do things too, where you could use Kimx2 if you wanted to, but um, I actually have something that I use for my desktop environment config. Let's see, do I have my, no, it's probably actually in David Will slash, uh, well, no, let's look at it this way, X session. So you can see here, this is my X session file that actually is how my desktop environment gets launched. I'm calling into Emacs, I forget the dbus launch thing, but uh, here I'm calling into Emacs and I'm using it with profile default, but I'm also using this dash dash use exwm. That's not real. That doesn't actually exist as a parameter to Emacs, but I'm, I'm able to look it up. Um, let's see. Use, whoops, use Emacs. Where do I have that? Let's see, use Emacs. Come on, we just saw it. Uh, should be a desktop.el. Let's check it out. Let's see, dot emacs.d lisp desktop uh, use exwm. Wow, is it my main? Oh, I bet it's in my main file. Use exwm. There it is. Okay. So you can use uh, the command line args variable, which is basically just a list of all the parameters that were passed into Emacs. And you can see what parameters are there, even if there's a parameter that is not actually valid for Emacs. Now, um, sometimes Emacs will complain that you've used a parameter that isn't real. Uh, let's actually check that out. Let me go into vterm, Emacs dash Q. I don't want it load up, loading up my config. Um, use exwm. Okay, so it didn't actually complain, but it did give me a message down here, unknown option, use exwm. I don't know if that shows up in my actual personal config. Let's see, uh, control H E, um, use exwm. I don't see it, but that may be because uh, something about loading Emacs from geeks just obscures that uh, message, but it doesn't stop your config from loading. So you can put whatever parameters you want on the command line. You don't need to use Kimax for that. You can just say, you know, Emacs load Python. And then you and your code could check for that parameter and then load the Python module if you wanted to. And you could write some code to make that sort of a nicer experience to, to write those command line parameters. I don't know if there's some other way in Emacs to automatically register a parameter, but uh, this is something you could do if you wanted to. Let me check the chat here really quickly. Uh, T Mehboob, I don't know. I'm not sure if that's a, a real name or not, but uh, hey, SC, big fan, kudos. Thank you very much. Uh, Tomas says, uh, Katha was one of those funky terminal emulators. Yeah, definitely. Uh, someone says, how about DWM? I, I'm definitely interested in playing with it on a video, at least, because it's it's interesting for various reasons. Hey, Case. Uh, Case says, re regarding Herbstluft, I wanted to write uh, an Elisp tie-in to Herbstluft. Should be possible? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Herb Slough is very nice because it has a command line application that allows you to control everything, even set con configuration parameters. So the reality is you could write a Herb Slough configuration using Emacs Lisp if you wanted to. So uh, that is something that is kind of interesting to think about. Alejandro says, DWM is great if you know a little C and understand what DWM is doing. Yeah, that's the, that's the trick. You have to understand what D DWM is doing. Uh, Peter says switching profiles per directory via dear locals might be useful. That is a very good point. So um, let me check this out really quickly. Uh, you could also use uh, dear locals dot el to um, 
well, let's see. Uh, load a specific module when entering the directory. So you can start up a, a standalone Emacs session in that directory. And when you load a file there, it should load up the module, like the Python module, let's say, or some other module. So that is actually a good point. You could, you could use that as a, a strategy for not having to manually call into Emacs and say, I want to load, load it for this purpose. You could just have it uh, come from dear locals for certain types of projects. Definitely a good point. Let's see. Um, uh, Case says, I really liked WM2, but it's gone now, though i3 is the spiritual successor. i3 is good. Um, super solid. But I don't know. I, every time I go back to it, I just feel like I've already used it before. It's not really interesting to me. So uh, it, it's great, though, and really, really worthwhile. And, you know, if you want to use Wayland, Sway is a good example of a i3 for Sway. So i3 for Wayland. Uh, Eric says, I played around a bit with Spectre WM and it's pretty comfortable for that use case, but I mainly use Awesome configured in Fennel Lisp. Nice. Uh, K says, does Awesome have that manual tiling PR merged yet? No idea. I didn't know they were going to try to do that. Uh, Alejandro says, hey, I use the same trick to detect EXWM. Nice. Uh, Arnav says, would these modules be configurable with an org file? You could certainly do that. Uh, we should talk about how to configure these things in just a second, I think. Um, let's see. Uh, Pavel says, I think you can do the same thing with i3 message. Well, Pavel would be the person to know because I think that Pavel wrote a pretty extensive uh, integration between Emacs and uh, i3, I believe, using the i3 message uh, command line tool. I don't know if you can do configuration with it, but you can definitely invoke things to happen with it. Yeah, Pavel says, I'm not sure if it allows for configuring every parameter. Yeah. Uh... Okay, Ashraz is correcting my German pronunciation. Thank you. I do appreciate that. It took me a while to notice you talk about a Herbstluft. In German, the pronunciation of BST brings you to a uh, full stop, stop. So Herbstluft. Okay, thank you. You know, it's it's difficult for, for me uh, <laughs> to know how to pronounce things. So I welcome all help. Uh, Fade says, if you combine that with a system to scaffold projects, it would be low overhead, at least for new projects. Yeah. For sure. It's basically just stamp out your dev environment along with the project. Uh, awesome gets manual tiling in 5.0 apparently. Okay. All right. So uh, what do I want to mention next? So this sort of tells you about the style of configuration and how you could uh, do things. Let me pull out to the big view and see if I should rearrange it. I kind of want to just put together some thoughts in a more organized fashion and not just, you know, leave it all. It's just a hap hops luft, hap hops luft. I don't know if that's actually true. Gun likes to toy with me a little bit. Okay. Uh, Fade says you can control a stump WM through an API. So integrating it more tightly with Emacs would be straightforward. Yeah. Um, there is some code you can grab on the internet that allows you to directly send S expressions written in Emacs Lisp over to Stump WM to evaluate them there, I think. Stumpish, yeah, Stumpish also does that. <laughs> uh, okay, so. Load necessary things for everyday use. Might use environment variables. Yeah, okay, well, let's just leave it, leave it there for now. Okay, so works well across multiple platforms. Use system type variable to choose which configuration parts you to load. Maybe, I'll just say maybe, use system name to do uh, system. Mm, what's the right name for this? Machine specific uh, configurations uh, when multiple machines use the same OS. Uh, okay, so can be configured with geeks. There's sort of a higher level point to be made here. It's something we actually did in Rational Emacs that um, makes this possible. I was thinking ahead whenever I sort of designed it like this. Now, I'm not saying that this is like some 
unique design. It's probably pretty obvious, but there are reasons why I chose to do certain things. Uh, like for instance, if you go into uh, rational, let's see, rational UI. In rational UI, the uh, basically the UI configuration module, there are a number of uh, variables that are defined, like def custom, uh, rational UI default font. Um, what else? Def custom uh, UI line numbers enabled modes, various different things that are variables that you can set before you load the module. Now, obviously, they, uh, the people who are working on e Rational Emacs right now did a really nice thing and made it so that there's setters here that when you change the value using the configuration or the customization system, it will update this for you. But the idea is that you would set these variables before you load the requisite module in your init.el file so that um, they you do special configuration of those modules uh, at the time they're loaded. Um, so this matters for Rational Emacs if you want to configure certain things before you load the modules, but it also is very important for geeks, and I'll tell you why. So it's nice to have actual Emacs configuration written in Emacs Lisp. Now you could go so far as to generate Emacs Lisp for an entire configuration using Geeks Home and Scheme, but I feel like that is kind of a pain in the ass. And I would not personally want to, to write the scheme code to generate all the stuff for the Emacs Lisp configuration, because there are gonna be snippets that you have to write that you can't easily just put together in Scheme. Um, so what I would, typically want to do to configure such an Emacs configuration using Geeks is to generate the set of variables that I'm setting that are put at the beginning of my init.el file using scheme, but then everything else gets loaded from modules that are written in the Emacs Lisp. So the way that would turn out, let me just jump back over to this. So um, all configuration modules are written in a well slightly platform agnostic way maybe you know maybe some special casing and then um when configuring emacs via geeks uh the geeks home uh what we call it Mm, configuration services. Let's see. Uh, configuration points are exposed via def custom and def var. Configuration points of these modules. And then when configuring Emacs via Geeks, the Geeks Home Configuration Services will uh, expose their own variables so that you can uh, configure certain things at the scheme level, then uh, the corresponding Emacs Lisp will get generated um, and loaded as part of Emacs startup. So uh, that's sort of the idea. You would have maybe a generated file that gets pulled into the init.el or you're, you don't actually have an init.el and you use the one that, uh, that Geeks Home generates for you with all this stuff in there and maybe your base set of modules that you want to load. And then when you load Emacs up, it's already pre-configured. Now, the benefit of this is that you can do machine-specific configuration. So, you know, certain modules can be loaded. Um, their dependencies will only be installed uh, on that machine. That's kind of a nice thing. Uh, what else? There was, there's some some other aspect of this is important for geeks but that's that's kind of the main thing is like you can easily say like uh, there's a system specific configuration for that machine let me show you exactly what i'm doing in my my geeks home config which is pretty minimal as it goes but 
Uh, in my dot files folder, I have basically a guile scheme module path, Davy will slash system slash, let's say phantom. That's for this machine. So um, this file contains both, both the home and the system configuration for this machine. And the home section says which packages I want to load. This gather manifest packages is something that I wrote, so don't pay too much attention to that. But we can say which, which services we want to pull in. So uh, the point would be that uh, you would be able to pull in certain um, geeks level packages for Emacs configuration for various different things and then set the variables in those for the specific com system configuration. And if you had like a sort of a share config that gets used across your machines, you could you could parameterize that just by using a function. Um, so we're, you know, we're at the level of scheme at that point, you have full code available to you to do that. And then when you apply this configuration for the specific system, whatever you set in there will be used. So if you want to set a specific theme or a background image for a particular machine, you could do that. Um, fonts, certain uh, Emacs packages that you want to install and configure. Um, even whether you have the window manager set up a certain way, like if you want to use EXW on one, one machine and i3 on another machine, you can do that. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility on how you could do system specific config. And this really matters most for people who want to use Geeks. Now, if you're using other uh, Linux distributions which don't have this sort of functionality, you know, Nix could do it because Nix has Nix Home Manager, but all the others don't really have it. You know, like this kind of model is not available in lots of other places. You could probably use Chez Moi and other dot files management tools to do it, but eh, I guess you could actually do that so, because Chez Moi, I, Chez Moi, if I'm pronouncing this correctly, I know there's probably somebody here who can who can correct me if I'm wrong. Chez Moi. Uh, this is a tool that enables you to um, templatize parts of your dot files. Uh, you could also do it with the org mode too, if you wanted to, but um, Chez Moi, okay. So there's a lot of ways you could do this and I think that it's a pretty useful strategy if you use multiple machines that uh, are using Linux or potentially even a BSD because I think a lot of the tools are available there as well. So um, basically the idea is um, even if you don't use Geeks, you could probably use standard dot files management tools like Shimwa. Uh, to accomplish something similar. So um, that's sort of the idea. You have multiple Emacs Lisp modules, and then you expose variables from those to configure specific aspects that you might care about for different machines. You don't need to expose everything because if you're going to have some part of your configuration that's the same on all machines, you might as well just write it hard coded if you're not using something like Rational Emacs. Then only expose variables for the things you actually do want to change per machine. Then in your init.el file, you will configure those things per machine and then um, just write out your init.el file from that and then load up only the things that you want. All right, let's see what people are saying here. Fantasy Enjoyer says, what's in Emacs? It's a, it's a dangerous thing that you know people shouldn't be trying to use, I think. Uh, Fade says, I used for a while a system laid out by uh, Magnar Sveen to do host-specific configuration. I just read the host name from the system when Emacs started. Yeah, that's definitely uh, possible. Let's see. Tomas says, you can check the pronunciation on Google Translate. I use it for Thai often, for example. Yeah, it's probably a good idea. Uh, Jeff Bowman says, uh, Emacs 29 coming with init directory command line flag so you can switch to different module configs a la Chemax. Yeah, that's going to be super nice, I think. Yeah, Jeff wasn't here for that, Ashraz. <laughs> okay. Uh, Case says, I wrote a minimal package called machine.el for per machine configuration. Let's, let's check that out. Let's see. Uh, duck work? Is that is it duck work? Uh, machine.el. Come on now. Come on now. Is it on uh, Source Hut? The internet is not giving it to me, Case. You got to tell me. 
let's see github.com duck duck work i think that's right isn't it yes uh i don't see it here where's the button for repositories there it is i'm doxing you case i'm sorry uh machine.el there we are so let me just copy that over here So let's take a look real quick. Since we have some time, let's just take a look at what's in here. Uh, maybe it got filtered out of the stream. I think it did. If you agree. Ah, Yadam. Okay, thanks, Thomas. That's the other... Uh, and Alejandro both mentioned Yadam. Uh, let me put that in the... Or Yadam. Or Widem. I don't know how you're supposed to pronounce that. There's too many things that we don't know how to pronounce in this uh, field, I think. Okay. So, let's go back to uh, machine.el. Let's see. Yeah, this is probably the, le the amount of code I would expect for this. Let's see. Machine load directory. So, there's like a mach em Emacs machines file, the directory where machine-specific configurations live. Uh, okay, so default font, default height, variable fitch pont, fitch pont, good. Uh, variable pitch height, files order, interesting. The order to load machine files in, huh. System type, system name, current user, cool. I like that. So machines, yeah, so this is actually similar to what I had in mind. But I was thinking of writing a macro to uh, to do this rather than having a variable that has to get read. So plist of machines that Emacs is in, the keys are as follows. Uh, do not edit this by hand, instead call machine get machines. Machine, he okay, maybe you do have a macro after all. Let's see, where is it? Uh, Machine set, okay, so it's it's a config file, right? Machine settings load. After load theme, okay. Get files. So there's no example of the um, actual format, is there? Except for just maybe it's a list that has these things. PRs are welcome, Case says. Go for it. Ashra says, just use the complete name of the uh, tool all the time. Yet another dot files manager, or Yadam. Color theme approximate is useful if you find yourself running Emacs on a remote terminal a lot and you don't want to screw around with per host themes. What is that? Color theme approximate? Oh, is this like a... Aha, uh -huh, package. I haven't seen that one before. Pretty useful though, because if you use you know nice uh, 256 color theme and you can't use it on the terminal, then uh, everybody has a sad case. Uh, yeah, I think it's a good idea to write documentation, but I can understand not doing it if you you know don't have any users yet. But now you might have, so you should probably think about it a little bit. Okay, what else do I want to say here? So working well across multiple platforms. Um, is there anything specific that we need to keep in mind? So let's say things like, you know, standard file paths for certain things or avoiding certain or going shelling out to certain programs. Use eShell for all shell activity. I'm gonna make some eShell videos soon for sure. Ashra says, it's a self-documenting editor, so it will document itself after a while. Well, it would be nice if it did that, but it doesn't really do it without some help. Okay, let's see. Okay, let's talk about this uh, standalone Emacs sessions thing. So the idea, which we've sort of gone over by now, but I wanna kind of illuminate why I think this might be useful. So if you are, um, you know, working on multiple projects at the same time, 
uh, managing all the buffers and windows in Emacs can be challenging. Now, obviously, there are lots of tools for dealing with this. But it's still not perfect. So what if you can um, just launch a special purpose Emacs session uh, that isn't connected to your main session to uh, load only the packages needed, uh, packages and files needed, I suppose, uh, and, and keep uh, your buffer list clean. So let's think of some reasons why. Um, you know, if, if Emacs gets in a bad state, just kill it. You don't have to worry about, you know, whatever state you have in your main Emacs session. Um, not needing to load a bunch of uh, unnecessary tools or packages. Now, obviously things like use package or uh, with eval after load um, make this less of a problem. Still, it feels like, you know, why bother loading, you know, things that that can deal with language servers or maybe, you know, special purpose packages for certain things if you don't really need them at the moment. Uh, you can't unload them once they're loaded. So if you have an Emacs session that's been up for a while, you're going to have all kinds of crap loaded into your Emacs session, all kinds of packages. Oh, I shouldn't say crap, but, you know, lots of things are loaded into your Emacs session. Uh, lots of files are open that are just sort of sitting around there. It takes up memory. Probably doesn't really, you know, hurt the functionality of Emacs that much, but it's just like cruft. It's just state that probably should not be there. So it would be nice if you could just sort of shut it down after a project's over. So for me, um, oh, and, and Fade makes a good point, which I'll get to in a second. For me, I, I think that th there's, there's also another concept that is a little bit higher level than this, which is um, when you're finished working on a particular task, uh, close everything related to it. So you could do this, obviously, if you have, um, like I think pr perspective mode, it makes it possible to kill all the buffers related to a perspective, but it's still a little bit dirty. It can make mistakes, you know, it's not necessarily the cleanest way to go about things. Sometimes it's nice to just close Emacs and say, I'm done with that for the day. I don't want to deal with that anymore. Uh, especially if you're using the same machine for personal stuff, work stuff, etc. So it would be nice if you had, you know, let's say two, three Emacs sessions running simultaneously and you could kill one of them and then, you know, the rest of them are just still available to you for whatever you want to do. And they're also sort of got their own things loaded up. So the thing that Fade said that uh, it makes sense to me is, um, you know, some blocking operations like uh, network traffic from IRC, mail, etc., um, can make it uh, harder to deal, uh, harder to use Emacs smoothly, I guess, while working on something unrelated. So um, my thinking is that I would potentially have one main Emacs session that does things like, you know, IRC sessions, uh, you know, checking my local mail for updates, um, dealing with my org, my org notes, basically, all, all the stuff I want to be writing or task management, that kind of thing. Maybe just my shell also, and then have other Emacs sessions specifically for projects that I'm working on. And this would actually make a lot of sense in a context like a window manager, an external window manager like uh, Herbst Luft, which allows me to, you know, sort of create w workspaces at will. Um, I can create separate workspaces for specific things that I'm working on and then just get rid of that workspace in the Emacs session that's in it after I'm done. Um, and I'll still have like the sort of workspace, like, you know, Emacs per workspace kind of thing like I have with EXWM, but uh, it will be a little bit more standalone and not so heavily intertwined. And if one crashes, it doesn't take everything else down with it. So uh, I know it's kind of, maybe it sounds a little bit overkill 
and it is a little bit overkill, but whenever you start to invest more and more of your time and your life and all the things that you do into Emacs, uh, I guess you come up against certain issues that maybe make you think, okay, maybe I should change the way that I'm actually using this program. But then again, part of the benefit of Emacs is that you can do all these things in one place. So you lose some of that um, ability to move around quickly between buffers that are unrelated, I think. So I don't know, it, it may be something that I would do for a while and change my mind on, but I kind of feel like there's uh, a reason to do it. Thade says RAM is cheap. Yeah, RAM is cheap indeed. I don't, I'm not really worried so much about the RAM being used, but I'm more worried about like cruft and instability and just having a bunch of buffers open that I don't care about when I'm looking at this particular Emacs session. Alejandro says special sessions per application. How would I communicate between them? <clears throat> Um, well, I don't know that I would try, but it's a good question. I don't know that I would actually try to communicate between the sessions. If there was a reason to communicate between the sessions, it might just make more sense to use a single session for multiple things to do. Let me see what's happening here in the chat. Pavel says, sounds like a task for OpenAI. You know, I've been seeing a lot of these uh, doll E, however you pronounce that one, images around lately, and it's a little bit freaky what uh, AI is capable of now. Let's see, doll E. Let, let's, let's just, for one second, just play with this, because it's kind of funny. Where is the thing? View the code. I want to do the thing. Where is it? Is it this one? Yeah, I think it's this one. I think I used this one before. So anyway, the, the point is, you know, eventually AI could potentially write the documentation for us, but we're gonna do something else. Uh, Richard Stallman eating a scone. Let's just run this. It may take a little while. Oh, too much traffic. Yeah, people are having too much fun with this, I think, so. Ah, is it gonna do it? Maybe it'll do it this time. Anyway, while that's running, I will... Uh, <laughs> Take a look at the chat. Uh, Alejandro says, guessing that for each project I need to send email, would I need to have several MU4E, one for each session? I see why, but don't like the solution. Well, it's possible you could do that, but probably I would just use my main Emacs session for that. Um, let's see, Trot says, after a day of using Emacs for everything, you absolutely benefit from kill Emacs, especially when the garbage collector has gone into overtime. Yeah, definitely it makes sense to sort of, you know, clean up after yourself after you've been using it for a while. Creeper says, I've been trying to configure Emacs. Where did that go? Um, Tremax, so that it opens on startup. How do I do that? You probably need to set a hook on the after, what is it? After init hook. So if you run Tremax as part of after init hook, it should start up after Emacs is finished loading. Midnight mode, what is that? Uh, function, midnight mode. Oh, wow. Cool. I actually didn't know about that. That's dope. So basically, this is a package that's built into Emacs that um, when you turn it on, it sets a timer that at at midnight, it will run a specific hook, this midnight hook, and uh, and do some things. K says, mom says, it's my turn to play with doll E. Thomas says, RAM might be cheap, but if you do not have uh, free lots to put it in, or maybe it's maxed out already, then the price is not relevant. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's various reasons that don't really require it to be RAM. That's the, sort of the blocking issue. Come on, Doll E Mini. Let's, let's see Richard Stallman eating a scone. This is kind of a rabbit hole. We're not going to do any more after this. All right. Ah, a case says by default, midnight moon deletes buffers you haven't used in a while. That's probably pretty useful for me because I've got the same Emacs session up for a while. What, let's see. Uh, Emacs, I'm on another machine right now. Emacs uptime, 23 days, 9 hours, 1 minute, 50 seconds on my other machine that I use primarily. So, yeah, I mean, if, you're, if your Emacs has been up for 23 days, then maybe it does make sense to clean up some things uh, at midnight. Oh, here it is. <laughs> what do you think about that? There's uh, Richard Stallman eating a scone. Now, this is 
kind of terrifying because you know they get the shape right but it looks a little bit um grisly or ghastly i guess you could say but uh you know ai does a scary decent job <laughs> these days trad says horrifying yes it is horrifying this is definitely out of a horror movie probably you could make a horror movie about uh richard stallman eating scones and uh terrorizing you about free software all right. What else? I think that answers the why. <laughs> we were all having a nice day. The scone ending. Trot says, what system are you leaving up for 27 days and aren't uh, bothered by it? It's, it's my main machine that I use for all of my actual coding work, uh, all the writing that I do for System Crafters episodes, everything. Um, so yeah, I'm using it all the time, every day, for all the stuff that I do. And it's my window manager also. So it's kind of, I mean, if I'm not doing streams, then it's very likely my machine will stay up that long or much longer because I, I don't mess with it because it just works much of the time. Hello, police, this stream right here. Yeah, this uh, that, that was horrifying. I'm sorry if I scared anyone. Uh, Alejandro says, uh, I get up to uh, 45 plus days. Yeah, well, you know. I think I've probably had it that longer, longer too, but sometimes it's good to just get a clean slate. Uh, Kay says, those aren't scones. Those are children who don't use GPL. Well, I don't know that he would go that far, but, uh, you know, he might try to eat some of their toe skin or something. Trat says, uh, I, uh, I need to learn to leave stuff alone. So, you know, it's fun whenever you use some Linux distributions to constantly be updating your software. And if you constantly update your software, then it gives you a reason to restart to see what those updates are. With Geeks, I find that I don't do it so much. Maybe it's just because of the way that I configure my system. Like, I just forget about the fact that I should update software, so I don't do it very often. So if I don't update software, there's no reason for me to restart my computer or restart my desktop environment unless I have to. So that is the main reason why I don't actually, uh, I could have uptimes like that because I just don't need to do anything. And I feel like if you want a stable computing environment, the best thing to do is not update your software all the time. Um, that's why I think, you know, using something like Debian stable, if you want to not use something like geeks could be a pretty solid way to have a stable system and uh you know not end up you know restarting your system all the time case says my emacs up type is like up of time is like just over an hour well yeah that's also fine you know there's nothing wrong with that uh pavel says i turn off my pc for the night yeah um that's kind of a nice way to sort of just clear out your mind for the day, especially if you're also getting rid of all your browser tabs. That's the other thing I wanted to mention. I have a bad habit, I'm sure many of you here also do, of leaving open browser tabs forever. It's like, okay, I'm not going to remember to go back to this page unless I have the browser tab just hanging open. So then every time you open your browser, you've got 150 tabs that need to be refreshed and maybe three other windows with their own set of 50 tabs each. Um, that's sort of like a an information and management crying out for help. An information management problem crying out for help. So I, what I'm trying to do is use org roam to sort of capture all the links that I'm kind of keeping open in my browser so that I don't have to use my browser as the way to remember those pages that I want to look at at some point or I might need to refer to. I don't do a perfect job of this, but I feel like this is a good practice so that maybe you only have one or two tabs open in your browser and you don't have you know 1500 that that show up every time you launch your browser let's see uh matthew says can confirm have not rebooted since last debian install about two months ago yeah i i you know when when you're younger and you know things are a lot of fun it's, it makes sense to be updating software all the time, but then whenever you are not as interested in updating software all the time, you've got like a kind of a setup you like and you want to stick with it, you end up not updating so frequently. Um, and it's, I don't know, like you just use your computer. It's a utility. It's not like some, you know, toy. 
But you know, it's, it's not bad to look at a computer as a toy. It's a toy too, but you know, sometimes you got to get work done. Let's see. Uh, Trot says, I would like to try out Geeks, but I have NVIDIA hardware. Debian is nice, though. Well, there is a possibility of using NVIDIA hardware with Geeks, with the non-Geeks repo. I still don't know how smooth that whole thing is, but if you go to... Oops, sorry about that. If you go to the uh, System Crafters wiki, wiki.systemcrafters.net, and you'll have to deal with it yelling at you about the certificate, uh, probably, because I need to go fix that problem. Sorry about that. If you go there... Uh, to the geek section, did we mention that NVIDIA? NVIDIA? Oh, come on. I know that uh, Mini KN wrote something about um, NVIDIA. Damn, where is it? We have a, a document about this. Okay, let me go to github.com slash system crafters. I think there's a wiki site repo. Yeah, right here. And then uh, content geeks NVIDIA. Okay, so it's there. I think it's wiki.systemcrafters.net slash geeks slash NVIDIA. We really need to link to that. PRs are welcome. Um... I'll put this in the show notes. Not really an appropriate place for it, but whatever. But uh, this is sort of a guide to how to use the proprietary NVIDIA drivers on Geeks. Um, there's a good chance I'm going to buy another machine soon that um, has NVIDIA, so I'll probably have to try to get this to work. Uh, I did try to get this to work on my ThinkPad X1 Extreme, which has a switchable graphics system with NVIDIA. But uh, if you remember last year, around this time, I bricked... I, I destroyed that laptop by trying to set a BIOS setting to turn it to always have the discrete graphics adapter on. So, didn't try that again. Ashra says, I stopped using hibernation on my work machine after I noticed that it tempted me to sometimes keep uh, unfinished work open for the next day. And now I properly close everything, which is a nice end of day ritual. Yeah, I really would like to have such a, an end of day ritual. Um, yeah, I need to try to make a habit of that. Case says, honestly, David, that's scarier than Eldritch RMS. I don't know which thing we're talking about now, actually. The the uh, certificate issue. Trot says, I'm on Fedora and it moves pretty fast. Not arch fast, but fast enough. Uh, Fedora is fairly fast. I used to use Fedora for a while and it's pretty good. I liked it, you know, for, for a stable distro it does move fairly fast it gets package updates pretty frequently i think that there's some feeling you get from updating software where you feel like yeah now i updated it it must be better but the thing is updating software comes with its own risks because if you update the software you might have a new bug and then your system will break in weird ways and you won't know why this has happened to me on multiple occasions uh more recently with obs which i use for streaming um, there was a period of time when the stream would just drop. I don't, I didn't know why I was blaming it on my Wi-Fi, on, you know, various other things. But what it turned out was I updated OBS and in the newer version, there was a bug that caused the stream to drop out. I didn't know about that. I had to go look at the release notes for OBS to finally narrow it down and figure out that it's, that was the problem. So, um, sure. You can say bleeding edge distros like, uh, Arch Linux or Arc Linux, whatever you want to call it where the packages get updated every day. Sure, that's risky, but even one that's not so frequently updated could also have its own risks. Um, like if you use Debian testing, um, I mean, Debian unstable is probably a bit better, but even Debian testing, that could be bad enough. So I don't know, it's updating software is a little bit risky. Whenever things are working, it's best to just leave it alone for sure. Our Primus, nice to see you. Uh, our Primus says, for browser tab management, have a look at extensions, bro tab and tabs aside. I haven't heard about those. Arnov says, I'm 17 and I'm updating stuff all the time. I'm using NixOS and changing around Emacs and NixOS config, uh, config is my favorite hobby. Yes, it is a very fun hobby. Um, it's very tempting to, to tinker with things, but then 
that your system just gets into such like a unstable state where you don't even remember which key bindings you have anymore. There's something to be said for, you know, sticking with something for a while, but um, it is fun to play around with different tools. And I'm, I, I'm feeling the pull to do that a little bit myself, but I'm so busy that I don't ever really have any time to do it anymore. Hey, Alex. See you, Case. Sorry that you have a muting. Yes, I need to fix my my certs on that site. It, there's something with GitHub pages that I got to do. Ashra says the end of day ritual obviously uses an appropriate org capture template. Well, that's a great idea because you really need to get all that state out of your head into somewhere that you can refer to tomorrow. So I like that. Alejandro says my end of day ritual is to close all buffers that are not work related. Well, uh, yeah, I could certainly do that if I wanted to, but uh, I just don't do it. I probably should. Ashra says, if I was using a rolling distribution, I'd probably use Tumbleweed due to their automatic QA. I didn't know about that. How about stable rolling release? I mean, yeah, sure, you could do that. I mean, I wouldn't say Geeks is a stable rolling release. The only thing about Geeks that's really stable is the fact that you can roll back to a previous configuration if anything goes wrong, which I think that's, that's the antidote to using um, software that gets updated frequently is just having a system where you can always go back to a previous working config. Um, that's certainly worth it. It's pulled me out of the flames uh, multiple times. So yeah, important stuff. This is why I'm not really interested in switching to another distro because um, the benefits of Geeks, even though there are drawbacks due to like, you know, hardware support not being there for certain things like NVIDIA, etc., or, you know, some software not being available, Despite all that, Geek still is the best distro, in my opinion, because of how you can uh, have control over your configuration and make sure that it doesn't get broken so easily. Artix, let's see, what is it? Mateus is saying, I'm looking to start using Emacs, but Lisp scares me, even though I program in C for quite some time now. Um, eh, Emacs is not scary. Actually, Emacs is pretty... Uh, fault tolerant, I guess you could say. I mean, if you do something wrong, then it's going to give you an error with a stack trace and you can go take a look at what you did wrong. Uh, unlike a C program, it's just going to crash. Maybe it will dump core. Maybe it will just, you know, crash and segmentation fault. Then you have to use a debugger to figure it out. But that's also fun. I mean, I can't say anything bad about C because I love writing C. So, And if you followed uh, Flux Harmonic, like some of you here did, you probably saw me write a ton of C, and I kind of miss it. I wish I could get back to that. All right. Anything else to say on this topic? Let's see. Uh, all the original stuff that I was talking about. Yeah, things to look at. Cool. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty much it on that topic. Um, we could try spend a little bit of time writing a macro, but then again, Case has already sort of done that machines config, which is kind of nice, but we might try it a little bit, see what happens. Alejandro says, Python scare me. I don't like snakes. Yeah, I don't really like Python, to be honest. I would love to get yelled at for saying I don't like Python. Ashra says, maybe the C program will leak memory and you will only notice that after 27 days of uptime. Well, that is a very real problem. That's for sure. Mateus says, it scares me because it looks like a Chinese tome. Well, it definitely is. Um, what is the right word for that? It's not coming to mind right now. Jeez. It's not apocryphal. That's the wrong word, but it's something like that. It's one of those, you know, words you use to describe th things that wizards do archaic is that right of an early period eh probably not trust says i used to enjoy python but then i discovered this channel and now i'm hooked to, into uh, common lisp and closure i will uh plug gavin's channel real quick if you uh like common lisp then check out uh, gavin freeborn's channel because uh, he's been making a lot of stuff about uh, common list recently. And I think it's a good idea to check that out if you're interested in uh, in writing some code for um, common lisp. A few different uh, 
things about you know scripting with Lisp, writing a game in Lisp, um, et cetera, et cetera. I'm jealous of some of the view counts he's getting on things. But anyway, uh, good to check out Gavin's channel for common Lisp stuff. Ashra says, I accidentally introduced a memory leak into our Delphi-based software that postponed the release by two weeks. Now, Delphi, I haven't used Delphi. Is that a compiled language that's not garbage collected? I don't really know. Oh, no. I'm not going to do that to Gavin. I, will, I don't even know if it would work. Um, I should do that to myself, though. Let's see. I'm sorry to show you Richard Stallman's horrifying, ghastly face again. Uh, system crafters youtube channel uh what what should we say in hell too much traffic come on you got to help me here give me the resources there we go it only complains once and then you click it again and it just works arcane thank you james that is the word that i was thinking of arcane yes emacs is rather arcane but there's a logic to it and uh, it just takes some time to figure it out. I've made a lot of videos talking about how Emacs works. So I think uh, it's worth looking into those videos, reading some other things like, you know, uh, Mickey Peterson has a book. Is that his last name? I'm saying that right. Uh, has a book called Mastering Emacs is pretty good. Um, there are lots of ways to learn about Emacs that uh, don't require just sort of, you know, banging your head against the uh, weird looking interface whenever you start it up for the first time. Uh, Benoit says, for getting started with geeks, I find Andrew's video about Guile Scheme a must. I didn't know he had one on that. Let's see. Andrew Tropin YouTube. Definitely check out Andrew's channel as well because he talks about uh, geeks extensively on his channel and Emacs as well. Let's see. Let's. Where's the search button? Guile. Scheme tutorial featuring Guile Geeks and G Expressions. That's a good idea, actually. A good, a good tutorial to check out. Um, because, okay, Guile by itself is, you know, different if you've never written Scheme before. But the way that Geeks has you write Scheme code, especially when G Expressions get involved, is very strange. So I, I would imagine he breaks that down because it's necessary. Uh, this is cool. What's he doing? He's streaming, writing some uh, some packages for geeks or for RDE. That's pretty awesome. Let's see. Has it done anything here? Yeah, we'll, we'll see. I, it probably can't figure it out. I'd be very impressed if it somehow managed to make this work. Let's see. Uh, Alejandro says, Arcane is not bad nor old. Uh, arch means main principle, first in grade, not only order. Yeah, for sure. Ashra says, there's certainly some code-based alchemy within Emacs handed from master to apprentice throughout the ages. Yes. All right. Oh, so that doesn't look like me, does it? Definitely got the YouTube and the hell part right. So, you know, actually, that's a great idea. I should just use this to generate thumbnails. Let's say uh, Emacs as a cookie. Emacs logo as a cookie. How about that? Come on. Let me run it. Gah. Got to click it at the right time. I think it's probably tired of me by, by now. Okay, we'll try it again later. Dolly will come up with an image that will scar us all for eternity. Probably. Alejandro says, those might be some system crafters, though. Yeah, it could be. Could be. Okay, this is not going to work. That's fine. I mean... Can't keep uh, playing around with this all day, but it is pretty frightening what it what what it will give you. So, come on. Wonder what the licensing is for images generated by this. Like, who do they belong to? It's uh, it's well, is it really different? Like, there was this whole argument recently, which probably still hasn't finished about training something like uh what's it called uh github code pilot copilot on um sort of the wealth of free software source code that's available that's licensed gpl you know people are saying that if you train a code suggestion model based on gpl code 
and you use it to write new code, does that mean you violate the GPL if it writes code that follows similar patterns to existing GPL code? Kind of a strange way to look at things from the new AI perspective. And I say that because in this case, can you just use any of these images that are created? Or is it because there's some similarities to, you know, actual people or copyrighted works that you wouldn't be able to? Like if you were to say, you know, Mickey Mouse riding a bike on this, it would be similar to Mickey Mouse, whatever comes out of it, but would it be Mickey Mouse enough for you to be violating copyright copyright laws? Alejandro says AI has no rights. No, but original copyright holders do. So it's a matter of whether um, the created work infringes on their rights. Okay, so now it's actually running for Emacs logo as a cookie. That's a lot more tame than other things. Maybe we should do a midnight stream where we just start putting in all kinds of really weird stuff, but, you know, maybe not a good idea. <laughs> no human has infringed anything. Well, not, yeah. LeBlanc says, I think Mickey Mouse might be public domain by now. Very close. I think it's going to be very soon. Piotr says, the whole idea of intellectual property does more harm than good overall. Yeah, that's a complicated one. I mean, um, as someone, meaning me, who's trying to create content for a living, I'm kind of torn about copyright because, you know, copyright allows you to, um, to monetize the works that you make because if you are the one who created the work and nobody else can make money on it but you, legally anyway, then it, it's helpful for you because it's a tool that you can use to create value for yourself. But at the same time, Copyright is also an, a, tool, a tool that's abused, especially by super large corporations. Um, so it's kind of a double-edged sword. So, I, you know, personally, I would like to find a way that didn't require me to use copyright as the tool to generate value for myself to enable me to continue making things. This is not what I expected. It doesn't understand Emacs. This is giving me a lot of uh, characters in other languages, it looks like. So, yeah, <laughs> that didn't work so well. So, yeah, copyright is, a, is interesting territory. All right, so um, I think we're good with this topic. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that we wanted to look at. Uh, we did mention before that we wanted to take a look at this new uh, command line option. What was that called? Someone said it before. I'll have to search for it on Emacs Devel. Probably is too far back in the chat for me to find it now. Let's see. Um, Emacs Devel archives. Init directory, thank you, Ashras. Uh, init directory, probably the news file or... Well. Okay, not what I expected. Yeah. Man, this old, like, what is this system? Namazu? Well, even that. Uh, searching for things on these old GNU mailing list archives uh, never works very well. Uh, I was going to look at the Emacs... Oh, let's just look at the Emacs mirror on, uh, on GitHub because I'm too lazy to go dig it up from uh, Savannah. All right, so if I want to do this, I can look into the news file, perhaps. Where is that? Is that in etc.? Yeah. News. News. Actual news. Let's see. Init directory. Yeah, there it is. Uh, Emacs now supports setting user Emacs directory via init directory. So this is kind of a nice improvement where you can launch Emacs saying that you want a specific folder to be the place where you load your config from, which means you could have a special init.el file that um, gets loaded in that directory, but then it could pull in packages from other locations. Uh, what we do in Rational Emacs, at least, is... Come on. Why are we doing this? Close it, please. <laughs> what did I do wrong? Close, thank you. All right, so... Um, init.el load path yes this one 
So you can just add a, a folder, any arbitrary folder to your Emacs load path variable, and then require will pull in things from that path. So you could have a number of folders within init.el files that pull in a shared folder as your Emacs module path and then do things that way. But it is a little bit too much of a headache. Alejandro says, still Kimax lets you set up environment variables. Yes, that is true. You could, Kimax has a few nice features that makes it a little bit more convenient. So I wonder if it would be possible for Kimax to leverage this functionality somehow. Like maybe if they expose, well, to, to make this possible, they would have had to make it possible to change user Emacs directory at a specific time. Well, it's probably in the C code somewhere. Anyway, basically, could Kimax benefit from this? Probably the answer is no, but. Ah, you said something about trying to write a macro. Uh, let's try to do that really quickly, just for funsies. So what I would like to see, let's see. Um, Just trying to think of a syntax for this, like per machine or per system. That's a terrible way to call this. On system. Uh, we could say. Linux. Could even do some things like and Linux, uh, Phantom, and then inside there you could do whatever you wanted to, but you'd probably need some other things too. It's almost like you need like a setup.el style package with macros and sub macros for the various things you would want to do, like you know load modules, and then um, you could say. Rational UI, rational evil, rational Python. Something to that effect. I mean, this is very similar to what you would do with PKs, but maybe it's just, you know, less syntax goop. So um, for all systems, You could use T, but that still doesn't feel right. All, maybe? Yeah. You, you could say something like, you know, well, I would say maybe load modules here. You pull in, yeah, how about this? Modules, rational UI, rational evil. And then for uh, Linux, you would say rational desktop. If we had like a desktop environment set up. And uh, on Windows, you could say load modules, <clears throat> rational PowerShell, which is BS. It doesn't exist, but you know, something Windows specific. Ah, so two, two nice ideas uh, from the chat. One from Jeff saying uh, with system as a possible name for the macro. That's a good one. And then Ashra says, I just found that you can define your own functions within command line functions to handle additional command line options. Uh, command line functions. Cool. So it's like a vector you can push things into. List of functions to process unrecognized command line arguments. That's probably a better way to do what I was doing, to be honest. Probably there's some docs. Is there anything in the manual? Yeah, view in manual. So there's, there's information in the manual about this apparently. Nice. Where is that? Come on. Command line arguments. You can use command line arguments to request, blah, blah, blah. Switch a list. User defined command line options and associated handler functions. This may be the actual better way to do it. You add something to the command switch a list. What am I looking at? With profile default, Lambda. Huh. Weird that Chemax would do that. But at any rate, that's cool. Um, what was the name of that again? Uh, uh, 
uh, command a list command a list command switch a list let me go back to the the notes org use uh command what was it god helper helpful command switch a list switch a list cool that's pretty neat Okay, so uh, I don't think we'll end up writing the code because we're going to run out of time, but uh, it would be possible to do this. I can show you something I did. I don't know if I still have that code. Do I still have it? I had written a macro like this a long time ago, but I might have deleted it. Deleted it. Jeez. Def macro? Nope, not in here anymore. Def macro. Why can't I search my dot .files folder anymore? Okay, I probably deleted it, but there was a point in time where I had a macro where I was doing some system-specific stuff. I simplified it a little bit, but the macro was kind of dirty. All right, so all uh, load modules, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> Set theme, I don't know, you know. Modus Vivendi. You could even not put that as a symbol. I mean, since you're writing as a macro, you could just you know, have whatever syntax you wanted. But <clears throat> there's something to be said for not deviating too far from uh, the desired syntax. And probably sh this should just be normal code, even. But something like this would be nice, I think. However, I would not write my entire configuration with this, like encompassing the whole thing so maybe there's a, a case to be made for just doing you know your normal requires here for rational ui etc sort of out of the scope of this sort of with system macro and only do system specific things in there so you wouldn't want it to be something where some somebody would try to like you know shove their entire configuration inside of this macro because it would just make things ugly defeats the purpose in my opinion okay so i would just delete all that but you could do like a system specific theme, like for instance on Phantom, if I wanted to say uh, Doom Pale Knight. Macro syntax is weird. Yeah, I wanna make a video on writing macros in Emacs Lisp at some point. With system overrides, does that exist? Because that just, the name sounds familiar. With system overrides, that could be, yeah, that, that could be nice. Crash override, yeah. Either override or crash. Fade is making reference to the movie Hackers, which I base all my naming <clears throat> naming conventions on. Excuse me. Lose my voice. Okay. So maybe one day we can try to write something like this on stream if people are interested. Uh, macro authoring is... It seems weird at first, but it makes a lot of sense. You're basically just writing templates for code. So uh, it's not super hard, but you know, it takes a little bit of getting used to because you're evaluating code in a separate environment from the one where the code actually runs in the end. So it can be hard to wrap your mind around crash the planet. Cool, I think that's it for today. I don't know if anybody else has anything interesting they wanted to bring up before we head out, but um, man, I wish I would have saved those images from the uh, Richard Stallman eating a scone. Eating a foot. It's gonna block me, I'm sure. Too much traffic. It's gonna be horrifying. Step one, write the code that you want the macro to expand to. That's absolutely right. Step two, parameterize it. So Fade is giving some very good uh, advice on macro writing. So basically, you should write the desired output code first because otherwise it's very difficult to write the macro code. Why a foot? Because, well, there's a, um, hmm, a, th a thing that Richard Stallman did at a talk he gave where he was basically eating the skin off his foot. I know it's disgusting, but it's sort of a, a meme. Um, so I will also check in these show notes right after the stream is over in case you wanted to go refer to these things if you want to, like, try some of this stuff yourself. Uh, I will try to write some of these things and make it work at some point in the future because I do want to have my own configuration set up like this. 
Uh, Eric says, could you make a video on how to make file templates? Yeah, I actually am going to, I'm thinking about making a series, a short series, or let's say a series of short videos perhaps about uh, all of the different text templating systems that are in Emacs that are built in. So, well, then some that are not built in. So let's say uh, Tempo, Skeletons, um, uh, Abreve Mode, Deabreve Mode, Hippie Expand, and then other things like uh, Temple, which was made by uh, Minad. So there's a lot of stuff that I would like to cover at some point uh, for that. So I've got some plans for it. So yeah, we will we will definitely talk about those things. <laughs> Alejandro says, Richard Solomon eating Windows. That's probably a better idea, actually. Or eating the Windows logo. I don't know if this is going to show up, but we'll, we'll see in a moment. And I'll close the browser tab immediately if it becomes horrifying. So, uh, like I said, tomorrow we're going to have the new uh, video out for uh, Modus Themes, provided that Blender doesn't give me trouble because today I loaded it up and for some reason it kept crashing. Maybe I'll have to use Caden Live instead, but I'll get to edit it up and post it tomorrow. And then next week, I'll also do a video. I'm not sure what the topic will be yet. I might do something different. So, um, we'll have to keep a lookout and see what that's going to be. But I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to being back to making videos regularly again. Oh, God. Awful. Okay. Well, that doesn't look like a foot. That looks like a hand. This is sort of similar to the scone idea, but I think it's going a little bit farther down the rabbit hole of uh, horrifyingness. So he's eating his hands. That's basically what's happening here. Sorry, Richard Stallman. I hope you don't see this and get offended. I'm just, you know, trying to come up with the most uh, funny and shocking possible thing. Uh, is there any way where you write the template as standard Elisp? Uh, sort of, not exactly. Skeletons gives you, and, and Tempo both give you like a pattern you can use in Elisp, but it's not really Elisp per se. It's more like a template language. Anyway, okay, I'm gonna leave it on this note. I'm sorry for horrifying you. Hopefully you won't have nightmares all weekend about uh, terrifying Richard Stallman here, but I do wanna say I appreciate all of you for being here today. Thank you so much for your support and also your patience. I know it's been very spotty, all the live streams and videos recently, but I'm feeling good about getting back into things. And now that I'll have a house very soon, uh, it'll be even more reliable. So thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you uh, next uh, week and also tomorrow with a new video. So until then, happy hacking. Thanks a lot.